Before we begin, um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that we are in unceded Mi'kmaq territory. Um, in preparation for tonight's uh, little opening um, talk that I'm going to give, I've been really thinking about what I'm going to say. Um, I really wanted to start by saying something really smart, like, you know, oh, sorry. Good? All right. I wanted to say something really smart, like, um, you know, rising tides lift all boats, or one's ambitions is, you know, it uh, determines the future, whatever, right? Uh, or something like, you know, we are all in it together, but we all know that. As we were walking here with Jennifer earlier today, we were walking by, by Schmidtville, and she turns around, she looks at me, and she says, you know, Kurosh, Halifax is a beautiful city. And that was a reminder. Sometimes being in the world of planning, um, I, I know a lot of you guys share this feeling, it's hard not to be cynical. It's hard not to be positive and ambition and you know, show up every single day after a big fight the night before at the public meeting. But the reality is we are all very lucky. All very lucky to be living in Halifax, a beautiful city on both sides of the harbor, both Dartmouth and Halifax. That's a shout out to Neil. Um, and uh, I really think tonight should be a celebration, another reason to celebrate the beauty of Halifax and uh, the hard work we all put in every single day to, to make our city a better place to live in. Um, I'd like to uh, make a pledge myself that I will do whatever I can in my capacity to make Center Plan a really a success story, um, an opportunity to seize and uh, make it a story that we can all um, in 20 years, 30 years, um, in my case, maybe 40 years, tell my children that, um, you know, th I was part of that amazing initiative a few years ago, and as a result of that, you're living in a more beautiful, a more beautiful and more diverse and a stronger community. Um, so with, th with that, I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, it's, this is another public meeting. I know it's not easy to go to them um, every evening, but... Tonight wouldn't have been possible um, if it wasn't because of the hard work of so many people. Starting from HRM staff that for the past two, three years, they've been putting time in, they've been putting effort in. So many people have been putting their best intentions forward to, to put a plan together. To all of you for showing up to every single meeting, not giving up and trying to make the city a better place. Uh, to uh, Jennifer Kiesmat for coming uh, to, tr to Halifax. She said no so many times, but she finally uh, decided to surrender to the beauty of Halifax. Um, and on top of that, to all the sponsors of this report, this is an independent study that uh, Jennifer has conducted over the past two to three months. She's been in Halifax at least three times now. Prior to that, she was a chief planner of Toronto, but before that, she, she worked on the HRM by design. And uh, I'd like to thank the sponsors of the study. Um, UDI, Urban, Design, uh, Urban Development Institute, uh, we got together and we really wanted to make sure that this is going to be a, a third party review to add to the work that's being done in the city. Compass Commercial, Polycorp, Southwest Properties, WM Furs, Arm, Armco Capital, Paramount Management, uh, the Lynx of Brunello, Blue Basin, water uh, Waterfront Development, Downtown Halifax, Chamber of Commerce, and TD. With that, I'd like to pass the mic to Jennifer so she can walk us through her presentation. Okay, are we live? We're live, excellent. So I'm going to take about 20, 25 minutes, I might go a little bit long, and give a bit of a summary or overview of the report that I prepared that hopefully some of you have had an opportunity to read. And what I'm going to do is walk through in broad strokes some of the key themes. And then Crash is going to come back up and we're going to take questions from the floor. So uh, don't hesitate to write down any questions that you might have and we'll have a discussion about some of these ideas. And my objective really is to highlight some of the key themes in the context of the work that I pre prepared. And as Koresh indicated, um, it's absolutely true that he asked me to do this and I said, absolutely not, that's way too much work. There's no way I'm interested in doing that. And then he asked me again and he asked me again. And I have to say that once I got into the policy documents, a couple of things became apparent to me. 
One of them was that I was reminded what an incredible journey that Halifax has been on, Halifax and Dartmouth. Back in 2005, I had a very little tiny baby and a fledgling planning and design firm. And I came to Halifax with my partners and I bid on a project that was to become known as HRM by Design. And with that tiny little baby, uh, I actually gave three years of my life and I had a tiny little baby at home and I was flying back and forth to Halifax. And I have to say that it was challenging and it was difficult and it was really exciting because it was very much about the question of how Halifax was going to move into the future in light of really a dawning new day, new investment, uh, a new way of thinking about its future. And it was a very exciting uh, moment to be engaged in planning in Halifax, in part because there were so many people, many of whom are in the room today, who were really just beginning to sink their teeth in a very serious way into thinking about things like the design of streets and the role that buildings play and uh, the civic obligation that buildings might have. And part of the work that we did at that time was we held a whole series of forums over the course of those, those three years. And those forums were typically two or three days long. They were a really big commitment. And they were about diving into the details and going really deep into what makes Halifax unique. And I really want to start there because I think that that's the opportunity in the context of this policy framework. As Halifax changes and grows, the opportunity is to become more of what you already are. Halifax is a profoundly unique and special, special place. I had a moment this morning because Crash dropped me off after I was on the CBC. I wanted to walk up to the top of the Citadel. And by the way, you're supposed to get there in a car, I discovered, because it's a long, windy walk uh, to get up there um, along, a, along a fence. Uh, but as I was walking up and I was looking out over the city, I realized, and I just never really thought it through very carefully before, that the very first time my mom and my dad stepped on Canadian soil was in Halifax, the very first time. And that was, they, they came here from, from Holland. Uh, as immigrants, both with their families when they were very young as children. And the very first time they stepped onto Canadian soil was, in fact, at, at Pier 21. And so many Canadians have an affinity for this city because it, in some way, is connected to their story. Not all cities can say that. And, in fact, it's something that we need to talk about more when we talk about the narrative of Halifax and its hundreds and hundreds of years of history that exists here. We can't talk about Toronto or Winnipeg or Vancouver in the same way that we can talk about the story of this city. And I say that from the very beginning because I think that that's where all of our planning must begin. It must begin with understanding what it is that makes this city unique. And I say that because there's both opportunities and risk as a city changes. And the opportunity, of course, is that you become more of who you are, that your identity grows, that you, in fact, become even more unique as you change. And the risk, of course, is that you just become like any other place. The risk, of course, is that you lose your heart and soul, that you lose what it is that makes this city so special. And that, of course, brings me to the Toronto story. Uh, this is the Toronto skyline in 2005, and back in uh, the 1970s, there was a plan created that was all about uh, transforming the downtown. It was all about taking those parking lots and introducing new buildings and creating a walkable, dense urban place. And that center plan in Toronto, which was created in the 70s, was radical at the time because it was a based on the assumption that in the future, people would want to live and work close together. It was based on the idea that the long commute would not always be a desirable, desirable approach to city building. And 
what's interesting about our city is that it took many years for that vision to get off the ground. There were a lot of variables that had to come together, including the creation of our green belt that really began to limit growth on the periphery of the city and drive growth back into the core. But we hit a tipping point not long ago, and all of a sudden, our city started to change very rapidly. And the risk, of course, is that your wildest dreams come true. <laughs> the risk, of course, with the regional center is, in fact, that you see growth accelerate at such a pace that change happens very quickly, and you don't even have time to think it through and to think through what's happening. And in some ways, I'll say that's what's happened in Toronto. And I only say this because I have the benefit of hindsight. I have the benefit um, of having been the chief planner in the city of Toronto for five years, which I didn't have when I was working on HRM by design. And so I do have some cautionary tales to share with you. And one of them, in some ways, is this. Um, and we usually use this kind of a slide as a little bit of bravado. But uh, watch this slide. This is 2005. And this is the downtown skyline in 2015. And this is a combination of the buildings that have been um, approved and built. Let me see if I can use this. All of this is the railway lands development. You can also see that there's, this is basically the young corridor. Uh, and in fact, the regional, the, the midtown center is beyond this. There's a never, another node of significant intensification that's even beyond this. So in some ways, we're that city where our wildest dreams are coming true. We're exceeding all of our growth projections. And that has resulted in all kinds of unintended consequences. And I, in fact, in this review, viewed the planning framework in some ways from that perspective. What if all your wildest dreams come true? What are the implications of this planning framework? And I also asked the question, well, what if the dream doesn't materialize? Because that's the other scenario. That is, in fact, in some way, the policy framework could act as a disincentive to growth, or it could not have enough incentives in place. And this is where there's a little, there's a little secret about Toronto that I have to tell you that um, most people are quite surprised to learn. So when I began planning in Toronto, one of the things that we were all talking about, and uh, former city councillor Bill Saundercook is sitting in the audience, uh, he will remember this, we were all talking about how we were adding so much residential into the downtown that soon we were going to have a reverse commute. That in fact people would live downtown and they would get in their cars and they would drive out to Mississauga to get to work every day because that's where the jobs were. The jobs were in the suburbs. That's where the employment growth was taking place. So this is the little secret. Uh, back in early 2000s, the city council wisely put in place an incentive program for employment. So all of those new office towers that we see in the downtown, TELUS, TD Bank, Deloitte has built a new office tower, all those new office towers, they are there because of an incentive program. And that's because the dream was to create complete communities. And I tell you that as a cautionary tale only because I think there is a risk, and I'll talk about this at the end of the presentation, if in fact you don't think very carefully about some of the economic drivers that will shape growth and that will be an impetus for growth and ensuring that there's an alignment between the policy and those economic drivers is going to determine whether or not the dream materializes. But in fact, there's another part to this dream materializing. And um, <clears throat> like, uh, like you probably do today when you look at Toronto and Vancouver, not that long ago, like just three years ago, we used to look at Vancouver and we used to say, whoa, look at those housing prices. How do people even live there? Uh, and in fact, uh, fast forward three years, and we're saying it about our own city. It's happened to us. The prices are off the charts. And I'll talk about that um, a little bit more. But when I say not so fast, what I mean is that there has in fact been um, an unintended consequence, which is uh, negative. And this is some work that was undertaken based on census data by a professor at the University of Toronto called David Helchensky. You can see there in the 1980 graphic that there's lots of yellow. Yellow is good. Red is poor. Uh, blue is the 1% or the 0.5%. And yellow is the middle class. 
And just as all that density and change and growth has taken place in the city, as we've become more urban, we've become more of exactly what we wanted to be. An interesting thing has happened, that we have in fact become an increasingly unaffordable city. That there's an entire population that is now struggling within our city to th survive. Uh, many are families, and we in fact have an incredible poverty problem. In fact, uh, the United Way has labeled Toronto the child poverty capital of Canada. We have a tremendous amount of wealth, and we have a tremendous amount of poverty. And I think this is directly linked to our housing policy and our approach to housing. But it's an critical consideration when we're thinking about the future of the regional centre and the role and the responsibilities and obligations of the municipality to think carefully today, right now, about ensuring that Halifax continues to be a city for all. And here's a graphic that shows you from 1990 uh, to 2015 um, how wealth has concentrated in the city. And it's no coincidence that it aligns very much with our rapid transit infrastructure and with our subway infrastructure. Whereas 20 years ago, you didn't really want a house near the subway. It was associated with untoward activity. Fast forward to 2015, who knew? But in fact, being near rapid transit is an amenity and houses are most ex expensive near that rapid transit investment. Now, in some ways, we knew that and we saw rapid transit as an impetus uh, for growth and change, but it has had this unintended implication of making it very difficult to access housing, access housing, particularly where it is needed most. So, you know, the big story here, of course, is that if you look in 1993, right around the time when the federal government said, no, thank you, we're not going to be involved in providing affordable housing in Canada, and that's when our markets unleashed and became something fundamentally different. The good news is that the federal government has just gotten back into the housing game with the National Affordable Housing Strategy and is also taking an interest in building affordable rental. And my cautionary tale is now is the time to be thinking really carefully when we talk about complete communities in Halifax about how you can be providing housing for all. And that's really the first big theme that I'd like to talk about. And there's six that I'm going to walk through. And they are really six, there are six broad strokes that are a way of organizing the 28 recommendations that you in fact see in the report. And the first really important idea here is that if you want complete communities in Halifax, there's actually a layer that's missing in the framework that you have in front of you today. And it really is about the role that the municipality is going to play in providing the services and the facilities to deliver on walkable, complete communities. And the plan is very strong in talking that an objective in adding density is to deliver walkable communities. In order to get there, it's critical to look at various areas within the regional centre and identify what the infrastructure needs are that are required to deliver on complete communities. And this involves collaborating with the province, on schools, for example. If you're adding lots of density, which is a good thing, it's going to deliver walkability, you need to ensure that you have the amenities for people to undertake activities within walking distance of home. And I'd just like to talk about this slide for a minute. Uh, it was put up there with some intention. You may recognize this as downtown Toronto. This is known, oops, this is known as the railway lands right here, this area right here. And this is a new development that hasn't yet been built on Wellington Street, which is an area that's just been revitalized right along here. This is our warehouse district, which has been turned into a lot of B office, office space. There's architects and designers that are, that are in those offices that are very popular. There's new residential that's being built. This building isn't, isn't built yet. What's interesting that you see here is that this is a new public library. This entire building here, you can see the podium and the tower, is all social housing. This is, uh, you just see some massing blocks here, but there are two new schools that are being built as part of this community. There's a recreation center that's also a part of this community. And now what you see here over the tracks is a proposal that we've brought forward for a 23-acre park to be built 
over the railway tracks in order to introduce a missing amenity that's critical to creating a complete community, which is in fact that neighborhood park. Right now there's nowhere really, uh, given the massive amount of density that you see here, for a whole series of, of community services and needs, but also a regional uh, destination kind of space. So the objective here was to think really carefully from a master planning perspective, what do people need as a part of their everyday life? 15 years ago, there were no grocery stores in this area. And the only reason that there's over 15 today is because of the density. So the question really becomes, how can we deliver on our objectives of creating a complete community? Well, we need to layer in the various amenities in our planning framework in order to do so. Now, the, um, I wanted to show another example because I think it's relevant in a, in a variety of contexts in Halifax. This is in a uh, suburban area in Etobicoke, um, a beautiful suburb that's not unlike some of your old historic suburbs that you have within the regional center, some of which I saw today that are absolutely breathtaking. And what's interesting about this suburb is that really today, um, if you want to get a coffee, or you want to get your hair cut, uh, or you want to buy some groceries, you get in your car and you drive to this 1950s plaza. This is the plaza right here. If you, you know, if you live right over here, you're going to get in your car and you're going to drive like this to get to this plaza. The opportunity of complete communities is about taking strategic sites and enhancing the neighborhood by adding amenities that don't exist and weaving sites back into the fabric of a neighborhood. And this is a Humbertown development. And so it's, uh, I was showing you it from this perspective before. This is Royal York in Toronto. What's being added here, you see a lot of green roofs. All the parking has been put underground. There are a whole variety of community amenities, including a new neighborhood square. So here you have a neighborhood, a traditional suburb, but there's really nothing you can do within walking distance of home. This is a way of creating a complete community by adding density. Here it's primarily in a mid-rise typology, which in Toronto goes up to 12 stories, um, with some higher density uh, developments as well. It also includes seniors' housing. Now, the reason I wanted to use this as an example was because I heard today in speaking with the mayor and some city councillors that one of the problems is that people don't want more density in the regional centre, that um, there's a problem with adding density because people really want, they're concerned about height. And I think that's actually for a pretty good reason. It's because the, there's a real emphasis in these guidelines on buildings and building design and the way each individual building works and how that building is set back. And that, from a design perspective, that's a good thing. But I think the focus needs to shift. The focus needs to shift on how are we creating complete communities and what are the amenities that we need to bring into a neighborhood to deliver that complete community. And I think if you showed up and said to me, I'm going to put a new building at the end of your street, and I would say, no, I don't want a new building at the end of your street. But if you showed up and you said to me, we're actually going to transform this neighborhood so that it becomes a walkable place. Are you tired of driving your kid everywhere? Well, guess what? We're going to design this neighborhood in such a way that you don't have to do that anymore because there's a variety of things you can do within walking distance of home. I think that's the opportunity and something that could be added to this planning framework. The second piece that I want to emphasize, which is not unlike the first, which is about being vision-driven in how we approach our planning, is thinking really carefully about heritage conservation districts and how we can add heritage conservation districts in a significant way in a relatively short period of time. And just to be very clear, there's a lot of different ways of doing heritage conservation districts. In Toronto, we have over 20 heritage conservation districts. We have five that are underway. We put a new system in place so that at all times we could be working on five districts at once. And we have nine that are pending right now that have been approved by City Council and ready to be, to be expedited. This is a really important part of, of confirming, if you will, the social contract really between residents and neighborhoods around what will be protected and maintained and what will change. 
and the heritage conservation districts is about recognizing that as you're asking the community to accept more growth, at the same time, you're going to ensure that you're protecting what makes Halifax unique, that you're going to be entrenching and enshrining the characteristics that, in fact, are essential to the identity of the city. Now, I should also say, because you only have a few, I think two right now, um, that heritage conservation districts uh, can span a very wide spectrum in terms of the amount of change that they can accommodate. So on the one hand side, you can have heritage conservation districts that are really about very little change, and they're extremely prescriptive to the point of architectural details that are enshrined in colors, that are enshrined in policy. And we have some like that, like the South Rosedale Heritage Conservation District in Toronto goes right down to the window awnings and the types of windings, windows you can have on buildings. In the middle are really the districts that are about some change, but might not be so prescriptive with respect to heritage, heritage details. The Queen Street West Heritage Conservation District, right where much music is, on Queen Street between University and Bathurst. That's an area where we were actually worried as a city that the financial district was going to kind of plow over this very interesting and unique part of the city. A little bit, the parallel here might be Gottingen, where there's an interesting history, where there's a small scale retail, a place where entrepreneurs can flourish. And so we put in a heritage conservation district that was all about protecting the scale of the neighborhood. Eh, the architectural detail, not so much, because it was an incredible mixed bag. Some of the buildings became individually listed, uh, but it was really about, it was about identifying how much glazing should be in, on a frontage, the rhythm of entrances to protect the main street character of the street. That was the real emphasis in the Queen Street Heritage Conservation District. And then our most recently approved district, which is King Spadina, includes where you have warehouses at the podium of the building and then a 60-story tower up above it. So a tremendous amount of change. That's a heritage conservation district too. And part of what's critical about getting these districts right is recognizing that different areas of the city have a different character and that change should reinforce that character. And you can do that well accommodating a significant amount of growth and change. And one of the examples uh, I thought some of you might be interested or might be familiar with is the Innovation District uh, and Mars, which is it essentially has a series of skyscrapers protruding from a heritage building. And it's done in such a way you can see the heritage building is, uh, is proud to the street. And the new elements are set back in such a way that the character of the street very much reads as it did 100 years ago. Another key era, area which I think is critical to emphasize in thinking through how this current center plan might be refined is defining character areas as a tool to determine future growth. And what I mean by that is that there's a risk if we paint in very broad strokes where height should go and where height shouldn't go. There are some areas of the plan where I actually think too much density is proposed when you look at the existing char character. And then there's other areas where I'm not sure it's enough. It might be that more density should be proposed. And so the question that I ask in the context of my review is, what's, what is it that is the rationale for what height goes where? And in Toronto, we actually use performance standards. So we separate sites into tall building sites and mid-rise sites. And then we use um, mid-rise standards as a way of determining that. Uh, this is an image of the Brickworks. And the reason I put this here is because the Brickworks is a very unique and special place in the context of the city of Toronto. It's not a place where you want a tower. But at Young and Eglinton, a developer came forward when I was chief planner and proposed an 86-story building. And I said, go to town. This is Young and Eglinton. This is exactly where a tower belongs. Uh, but the Brickworks, a tower does not belong here. And part of character is about recognizing that there are certain areas where significant growth should go and certain areas where it shouldn't. 
and having clarity about that and a really deep description of the existing area and what the future character will look like, I think is a critical way to building support for additional change and growth. And I think the risk is when there isn't clarity as to why density is being added in some places and why it isn't being added in other places, then it tends to actually get people back on their heels and they, in fact, want to uh, fight everything. Part of this is about modeling growth. It's about beginning to identify a broader framework. So this is an area, a corridor, that um, I thought was interesting for a variety of reasons, one of them being uh, not unlike, I think, the condition that you have on, on Quinpool. There's an area where you actually have depth that can allow you to add more intensity in terms of the scale and the size of your buildings. You can see here this is in part because of the adjacencies, which is an employment district on this side. But where we have a different adjacencies here, which actually is a relatively dense single family typology, the built form and the built form typology actually changes. So looking at a granular level as to what you can accommodate in a way that is not going to have any negative impacts is a critical part of using character, and this is what the streetscape of that area will look like, is a critical part of integrating the specifics of a street into the proposed policy framework. And my concern is that there are some pretty broad strokes in the framework that has been proposed that might not take into account the nuances of what will work and what won't work on specific sites. And this is the way along that corridor. This is a proposed building that's under construction. Uh, in the short term, it will look rather isolated. It will probably take about 50 years to build out this corridor even with the growth that we have in the City of Toronto context. And that really leads me to my fourth point, which is about capitalizing on density to deliver livability. The challenge is, it's not really about saying, this is how much growth we have. How can we spread it around evenly? The question is really, if you think about what I've talked about in terms of creating complete communities and then building on existing character, how can we capitalize on growth? Think of that Humbertown example. And the Humbertown example is really important because at first the residents opposed that project. In fact, they had signs made, you know, stop Humbertown. They, the residents thought it was going to completely destroy the neighborhood. They all went crazy. There was a real movement and people had line signs out, signs out everywhere. And it took about 18 months for that to turn. And it took a lot of conversations with the community. What are you concerned about? How can we mitigate those concerns? And what happened over the course of that process is that the residents began to change their mind. They began to realize that we could, in fact, deliver a more livable city and a more livable region by adding density into their neighborhoods, if it was done right. And there was a process of building trust that had to take place. And the, you know, I was giving this presentation uh, several years ago, and I said, you know, an amazing thing happened because the residents changed their minds. They participated in a process, and they started here, and at the end of the process, even, like, imagine, they went out and had line signs printed. And when the presentation was done, a woman stood up and came to the microphone, and she said, um, I would just like to say, I've been listening to what you were talking about, and I am the president of the Humbertown Residents Association. And I thought, oh, she's going to call my bluff. And she stood at the microphone and she said, you're absolutely right. We changed our minds. We saw things one way, and then we went through a process. And at the end of the process, we started to realize how great this would be for our neighborhood. And one of the things that strikes me about Halifax, and I've heard a little bit about it today, is that there isn't a lot of room for changing your mind right now. There's a lot of camps. There's a lot of polarization. I'm on the side of heritage. I'm on the side of growth. Instead of bringing those things together, how do they actually work together? And I think the planning framework, by actually identifying a strategy for expediting the heritage conservation districts, and for also identifying a very clear rationale for height that is based on the character of existing areas can actually begin to build the bridge, 
can build a vision that is shared. It's not just about individual buildings being plunked down here or there. It's actually about creating a livable city. And I have to say, it's not easy anywhere to do that. It takes a lot of negotiation and a lot of conversations, and it takes give and take. But if those conversations aren't even happening, you're in fact not going to get very good projects. And the best projects in Toronto, no matter what they are, no matter how quickly we approve them, and we are approving projects pretty quickly now, very large projects in a 12 to 18 month period, we never ever approve what the developer walked in the door with. And the best developers know this. And the best developers will say at the end of the project to the community planner and to the community, and sometimes even to the chief planner, you made my project better. My project is better because of this process that we went through. And that's very different from a process where an application lands on the table and there's a big fight over it. And thinking this through, how a vision that's based on this shared objective of complete communities, who doesn't want a school within walking distance of home? Who doesn't want a neighborhood cafe where you can bump into your neighbors very close to home? If you can build that shared vision and the opportunity of that shared vision, then people will begin to embrace change. And I'll just show you an example of um, how growth in a very specific context has been used in Toronto to capitalize on livability. So you can see here, this is a little bit technical, so I apologize, but this is the before ground plane. So this is uh, at Shepherd and Don Mills, just north of the 401 in the city of Toronto. And these are a series of towers in the, towers in the park. These are all townhomes. What's interesting about this community is that, as you can see from the way the streets are laid out, that no one walked anywhere. Everyone drove any, everywhere, and it was quite an isolated community. And the after plan was about adding density and critical mass that in turn meant we could add a community center, a new pool, a new library, and new retail. So right now in the first plan, all this was was a pile of housing. Absolutely nothing you could do within walking distance. In the new plan, as a result of significant new density, and I'll show you that in a minute, now a community center, a pool, uh, not-for-profit uh, spaces were added in the podium of some of the new buildings. This is about taking density and using it to deliver a complete community. So here's an example of some of the infill buildings. Uh, these are the existing buildings that you see in the background, and there are also some towers that were added over here, but essentially created a new street network so that there was a reason to walk within the community. Uh, using buildings and bringing them out to the edge of the street in order to create a pedestrian edge to the street. There are not-for-profit spaces, which was one of the requests that the community had in the, in the process, that are right here in the, in the uh, development. And you can see here what that looks like today. It's not the greatest photograph. Actually, it's a little bit dark. But you can see these are the buildings that were built at that street edge to create a gateway into the community. The most important thing we did here was introduce a pedestrian realm because there was nowhere to walk to and no one knew their neighbors because all you did was get out of your building, get into your car and drive away. There was nothing to do in the neighborhood. Now, in fact, we have, as a result of a public art competition, introduced, we call these beacons, and these beacons cut through the center of the site and they terminate at the new community center which is a destination and a hub. So now there's a reason to walk within the neighborhood. And now you can live in this neighborhood and you can, in fact, your kids can walk to swimming lessons on their own or they can walk to the library or they can walk to shops that have been added in the podium of the building. This is about taking density and adding density to deliver a more walkable community. And I actually believe that's very clearly articulated as the objective of this center plan. And my question is, is it built on the character of existing areas? That's one question. And the second is around the types of plans that are required in order to complement this, in order to deliver it. This is another example. This is uh, in, uh, on Eglinton Avenue where we're adding LRT. And this is where we've integrated built form with mobility. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about the integrated mobility plan, but here we're building out 22 kilometers of LRT, which is going through the center of the road. We're adding cycle tracks, widening green infrastructure, and then adding a mid-rise typology. 
And it's all about creating a complete community. Right now, in this existing fabric, you can only really get to any of the uses there one way, in a car. It's all been designed only for a car. So what we're trying to do is add a variety of ways that people can get there. There's pretty much one thing you can do, which is go to one of these big box shops. This is about adding a variety of uses and a variety of users and using density to create a walkable, denser environment. So this is what the corridor looks like today. And this is what the build out of the corridor will be. It's much denser. It's a mid-rise typology. Uh, it was approved, this concept plan and this planning framework was approved by City Council and now the secondary plan is being prepared for the area. This is a significant amount of change, but it's a change that will result in a more livable area. And that actually leads into my fifth recommendation, which is around integrating planning frameworks into a comprehensive vision. There is, of course, a risk if we have all this talk about being able to cycle and walk, but we don't actually link together the investments that are being made with the municipality with where density and growth is being directed. And that's sort of another part of the social contract with communities. When you add in that infrastructure, part of the reason why the community along Eglinton has been willing to tolerate a significant amount of change, and I live close to there, and it's a one big massive construction site right now, because 11 kilometers of the LRT are below grade, so a massive tunnel is being created. But we're sort of tolerating that because we've all bought into the vision of what we're going to get at the end of it, even though it's going to take a very long time to get it done. We've bought into that vision. So we bought into the vision that with growth and with the infrastructure change, that we are going to get a livable and more walkable community than we have today. It's a lot to ask people to deal with change. And you need the vision to pull you through both the planning process and also you need the vision to pull you through the construction process because in some ways that can be even harder. There's also a critical overlay with respect to open space planning. This is a new park, Bursey Park, right in downtown. It's uh, adjacent to our newest, one of our newest heritage conservation districts, which is the St. Lawrence neighborhood, uh, which I had the pleasure of both initiating and approving after many years of it having stops and starts. I like this image because you can see some of the, this is within the Heritage Conservation District. There's some density in that district that's been very carefully integrated. And as a result of this density, there are monies that were secured through a section in our Planning Act in Ontario, which is called Section 37. There are monies to, that were secured to build this park and to, to build really quality public spaces. This again is part of the promise of linking together growth and change. The integration of these various frameworks, the transit planning framework, the public open space framework, the economic development strategy, this is all critical so that you can, as you're going through your planning process, link together what will deliver on that complete community. And this, I do think, is something that needs to be significantly strengthened in the plan. Uh, the Integrated Mobility Plan, which I think is an excellent planning document, talks about how delivering a cycling and walking culture really comes through land use planning. You don't actually get cyclists just by putting in bike lanes. You don't get people walking if there's no destinations to walk to. So in order to deliver on that vision of a walkable center, the link needs to be made between the movement infrastructure, the public open spaces, and the built form. And it really needs to be made in the context of this planning framework. There's other policies that the plan is silent on. And this one has to do with pedestrian safety. And some of these are really easy to implement. And it comes back to the municipal role and municipal obligations. And I do think there's an opportunity to strengthen. What will the municipality do? The emphasis in the document is really on guidelines around new built form. But what's the municipality going to do on the policy side in order to support a walkable center? There's also a key question around delivering infrastructure. And it would be interesting to see a plan that overlays where there is infrastructure capacity and where growth is proposed because those two things 
should be connected. There's, in fact, uh, many schools in the regional center that are not at capacity. Should those areas be incentivized for additional growth and additional growth sooner? Because there's actually infrastructure capacity around, around schools or potentially parks. These are important linkages that need to be made. And this is a, a public art installation, but also a stormwater management feature that was delivered, not unlike your central library, on our waterfront as a way of attracting private sector investment. And this is an area where the plan can really lead. What's the municipality going to do to incentivize, think of Weiss Road, you know, not really a lot of market impetus to invest significantly in Weiss Road. What can the municipality do? What kind of infrastructure can the municipality do? How can the municipality redesign and partner with the private sector by incentivizing growth and investment? This was built in the middle of a brownfield. And now condos are going up all around it. And it's a large park called Sherborne Common. And it was meant to demonstrate the quality and the vision of what was to come in this neighborhood on the waterfront. And the last area I'll speak to is getting implementation right. Uh, this plan requires the modeling of scenarios. The scenarios need to be tested. I understand that was, there was originally going to be approach to managing growth that relied primarily on GFA. And then heights got added on top of that. And then there's a design manual on top of that. And the question I have is when you put them all together, what kind of a development envelope do you get? And the risk, of course, is that in areas where you need density to deliver on complete, communi com complete communities and to ensure that you have all of that animation and activity at the pedestrian scale, that once you layer on those three policy pieces that you actually don't get the densities that should be achieved in order to deliver on livability. So modeling needs to take place in order to better understand that. There's also a question with the impact, and this is a, a picture from Toronto, but the impact of some of the policies that make it, in some ways, the bar has been raised in the regional center through the design manual. That's a good thing. It's good to raise the bar. But have we just made it so difficult to develop in the regional center that we might be bumping growth that we want in the regional center into suburban areas? I think this is a critical question to struggle with. Is there enough of an incentive to invest in the regional center in light of some of the demands that are being put on new buildings? And there's a variety of ways that this can be solved. One of them is to take some of those demands and make them citywide. Put them on the suburban developments as well. Why do we have really high landscaping standards for development in the regional center, but you don't have high landscaping standards for developments in the suburbs? Make those standards citywide, and you will level the playing field. In other instances, in certain areas of the regional center, incentives might be required. Remember my example of the office in downtown Toronto. An incentive was required. It was not going to be delivered according to the market. The market win every time in Toronto is to build a condo. So the city had to incentivize, through the IMIT program, getting office into the downtown to create that virtuous circle that allows people to live close to where they work. 275,000 people live in downtown Toronto, 75% of them walk or cycle to work. Those incentives have been paid back in spades because the biggest impact in a municipality is actually on roads. And cycling and walking has a very low impact. So if you look at the incentives to deliver a complete community that might need to go out to the industry in order to deliver on this vision of a walkable, low-impact community, it's going to be chump change relative to the benefits that you will accrue as a city. The other question I have is with respect to affordable housing, and this is a critical one. There's a bonusing framework that has been proposed in the context of this plan. Uh, it needs to be modeled. I'm not sure it works. It's an incredibly aggressive framework. The worst case scenario is that uh, no one wants to do it, so no affordable housing gets built. Um, I think there's some other approaches that can be embraced that come back to municipal obligations and a municipal role. One of them is 
the municipality actually giving, giving land into the equation for the development of affordable housing. That's an important opportunity that needs to be explored. It's the opportunity that's worked in Vancouver, it's worked in Toronto, it could work here as well. The bonusing is also quite complex. And for that reason, the modeling of the bonusing needs to be studied in relatively granular detail to ensure that it can, in fact, deliver. I'm going to wrap up my comments there, and Koresh is going to come up, and we'll answer some questions. <laughs> we can stand. Well, thank you very much for that. Before we go any further, just wondering how many people in the room actually read the report that Jennifer has read, has written. Oh, wow. That's a majority. Well, so that's good. So I was worried that some people may not know why they're actually in the room, so that's, that's great. Um, I'm going to start the question Q&A with one question from me, actually. Let's get it out of the way right away. Um, how do you feel about the fact that this independent study was uh, sponsored by a group of largely developers <coughs> that as responsible, as responsible business owners, they are invested in you know, encouraging more density and more growth in the city. How do you feel about that being sponsored? Oh, I've got a mic. Um, well, I think it's great. I think it's um, precisely the kind of role that um, various industry stakeholders should take um, in actively engaging in a review process. Uh, I think it's also important to stress that my review is an independent review. It's not the opinions of those sponsors, but it is uh, my review as a professional planner and based on my experience. Um, I also think it's a really good sign because I think it demonstrates that there is a commitment to get this right. And of course, the risk when you get it wrong, I started out the report talking about this a little bit, in part because I had just finished reading Larry Beasley's book, which isn't published yet, uh, I had just finished reading his book about Vancouver. And the amazing thing about Vancouver is prior to the boom that happened over the past 20 years, there was a period where nothing happened. And in the preface to the book, he talks about that period. And it was because of a policy framework that was designed to um, promote kind of a modest amount of growth. And instead, it froze growth. And we have a similar story in Toronto. Um, we had a mayor who came in who was very much a reaction to some of the block busting that was happening in the 70s where residential neighborhoods were being destroyed and big terrible towers were being built. And he came in on a campaign platform of freezing all growth to nothing higher than five stories. And what that actually did, this was in the 70s, it froze the vast majority of the city at two stories, the existing condition. And it's only today, 40 years later, that we're starting to see those sites develop. And it's because we increased the permission to between 8 and 12 stories. Because the five-story wasn't a developable form. It wasn't a viable format. And it wasn't enough of an incentive for redevelopment. So we created new guidelines based on performance metrics that are now 8 to 12 stories. And that's part of why we see the boom taking place today. That five-story typology that David, Mayor David Crombie brought in, it never got built. It froze development in the city. Well, with that, I'm going to open up the floor for questions from the public. There are, there are two mics. Time is fairly limited. We have 30 minutes left. So try to keep the questions uh, to the point if you can. Thank you. Go ahead. OK. Um, uh, my question, I like your focus on the historic aspects of LFX. I moved from here from away. And that, what it, that is what attracted me here. But I'm a little bit concerned with the center plan and a lot of the discussion because in the course of doing the construction and the development, we knock out an awful lot of small business mm. who has no place to go. So I'm wondering if you could comment um, on what has been happening in the United States with the Historic Preservation Trust where they're focusing on developing incentives for developers to come in and work with older buildings and to make them, to use the older buildings to make them <coughs> profitable and to reintegrate them into smaller neighborhoods with smaller stores and to keep the business alive. So a couple of things. One is that um, those programs tend to have a tremendous amount of philanthropy behind them, which we, 
Uh, we don't have at the same scale, not even close in the Canadian context. The issue that you raise, I think, is a really critical one. And uh, one of the newest projects in Toronto is at Bloor and Bathurst. It's the Honest Dead site, for those of you who know it. it used to be all the garish lights. It's the Honest Dead site redevelopment. And in the process, in that whole project, which went from basically a big box to over 900 units, and it was approved in 18 months uh, through a rezoning, in the process and the consultations with the community, one of the issues that the community members raised was that they wanted to see small-scale retail reintroduced on the site to be more in keeping with the character of the rest of Bloor Street. And as a result, the developer committed to building uh, what's being called micro-retail. And so he's building a whole series of micro-retail units um, as part of the entire project, uh, which is, from our perspective, fabulous because the, we've had a major problem with larger scale projects that kind of wipe out all of that really fine grain retail. And it's more than a built form problem, it's also a problem of, of how commerce is unfolding. But he partnered with a not-for-profit, the Centre for Social Innovation, which is an amazing not-for-profit in the City of Toronto that works with social entrepreneurs. And they will be uh, bringing in their new entrepreneurs into the micro-retail in the podium of the building. And that's a really good example of collaboration, of the city building collaboration. When you have the developer at the table with the community and the residents are raising their concerns and the developer's listening and you get into kind of this creative space and start figuring out how you can do something differently, I think that's kind of the Canadian equivalent. And in that project, there are 29 heritage buildings on the site because uh, it also included Markham Street, which is heritage buildings, and there's, it's a full block, and there's another street with heritage buildings. And uh, 29 heritage buildings, the original proposal the developer brought in retained six of them, and we had a heritage workshop right at the very beginning and said the character of this site needs to be defined by those heritage buildings, and now the approval, 26 of them are retained and are being restored as part of the project. So, and that in many ways was the quid pro quo for the community. It was, a, it was a lot for the residents to get their head around the scale of this project, but the developer was so collaborative in really listening and hearing what their biggest concerns were. They were also concerned about affordable housing and the developer included 20% affordable units in the project. And that's really how we got to yes so quickly. Thank you. We'll, we'll go to that side there. Hi. I think I heard you say, or somebody said earlier, that you were walking through Schmidtville today uh, at some point, and just getting back to this city for a while. Uh, if you forget that it's a heritage conservation, it's about to be, I'm hoping, a heritage conservation neighborhood, we've got a density there of about 20,000 people per square kilometer, which compares to Barcelona and to Paris. Do we need to be any denser than that? And secondly, we're also highly affordable. We took a look at the Stats Canada details about the area, and we found out that the median income was $25,500 a year for people to live there in flats or what have you. And of course, there's people at the high end and at the very low end. I mean, obviously, with the way you get the median is halfway. But um, don't we have to preserve neighborhoods that are older like this? Because the minute you tear them down or erode them, you get increased ugliness actually, that can also go against affordability. We see new buildings coming up and they're not what most of us consider affordable. Uh, thank you for those comments. There's a few things in there that I think it would be good to, good to just touch on. First of all, I don't actually believe your density number um, because the densest point in Toronto, which is in the downtown core, uh, we'll look at it later, but um, is is comparable to London, which is 14,000 14, per square kilometer. So I, I find it almost inconceivable, having walked through today, that it, it's anywhere near the six-story typology and density of, I just can't, it, it defies logic. But I will, I will check, I will, I will do a little analysis of that. That's very hard for me to believe. Um, the, the other piece that I'll just say is, I actually think, one of the reasons why Halifax has so much character is because it is incredibly affordable. And one of the reasons why Toronto was such a phenomenal city for so many years was because it was so affordable. And I, the cautionary tale 
that I would like to propose is to actually um, be cautious because that affordability isn't something that you should take for granted because it's something that can change very, very quickly. Uh, I think the um, emphasis that I've placed on heritage conservation districts is precisely in response to that question of where density should go and where density shouldn't go. And Schmidtville is an example of an area that ought to be protected as a heritage conservation district. And I think there's not too many people who would disagree with that. Are, is there people in the room who disagree with that? I would, be, I would actually be pretty surprised um, if there's anyone in the room who disagrees with that. So I'm not sure what the, what the concern is. Tristan. Um, so, Tristan Cleveland, I'd really like to applaud you for uh, bringing this really valuable feedback to the Center Plan. It's a really important moment for us to be getting uh, an outside perspective on this. And um, my question is about, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we make sure that the original goals of the Center Plan are accomplished? We set out to create a, a plan for the city that would both at the same time uh, get the community excellent developments, but in such a way that it's highly efficient that someone coming to the city with a good building gets you know, pr approved very yeah. quickly so that it benefits developers as well. Yeah. And we're really incentivizing uh, development because we, there's that level of clarity on what we want. And the concern that I'm hearing right now um, here and, and from folks is that there's actually uh, so many different kinds of, of regulations or goals that the plan is trying to achieve that it's hard for someone to accomplish all those things. So developers aren't saying that this is going to be you know, the, the fast process or the uh, effective process they're hoping for. You have this comment in, the, um, in your piece here that says, default to the overarching intent of each chapter, not to the minutia of regulations. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if, if mm -hmm. that is what you're looking at as a solution to that issue or what you think mm -hmm. the most effective way to accomplish those goals are. Uh, thank you. I think that's a really critical question because it's really about the culture of how planning and development gets done in the city. And um, part of what I think the opportunity is is around having an ambition that is driven by a shared vision uh, that's shared by your, uh, many of your developers, of course not all of them, but many of them, and by your planning staff and by your residents to come together and to create a great city in better places. And there's a series of statements that are about that in intent. When you take all of the regulations together, and I, I know we've had this same struggle in the Toronto context, you end up not being able to deliver a product on many very specific sites, in part because you're dealing with an existing fabric where every site is different. And every site is frequently quite different, both in terms of its adjacencies. My answer is probably one you're not going to like, which is I don't actually think there's a shortcut. I don't actually think there's a way to basically say, you know, this is the package of what you're going to build, and if everyone builds within that package, we're all good to go here. Um, I just don't think that exists anywhere, and the places that have very, very rigid frameworks like that also typically don't have a lot of growth and change. Um, you can correlate those two things. And so there needs to be, you, there needs to be a way of managing this tension of looking at your framework and how you can work within that framework around those shared interests in order to deliver on a whole variety of objectives. And bringing that together, we ask the question in the City of Toronto, we would literally look at a project at the end of the day and say, is this good city building? And the, the, the example that I gave on the Honest Ed site is a really good one, because that was actually anticipated in an earlier policy framework that I wrote as a consultant before I was chief planner. It was anticipated that that would be a mid-rise site. That was what was anticipated. Here I am, I'm the chief planner, a developer comes forward and proposes a 28-story building <laughs> and a tremendous amount of density. And of course your first reaction is, this must be bad. Well, why? It's not inherently bad. Height isn't inherently bad. It's important to have that conversation. So then we ask the question, well, how does this project, what's being proposed here, perform on meeting the objectives that we have in creating a livable community? <coughs> Excuse me. And that's where we started having a conversation about the heritage buildings. Sorry, I need some water.
we started having a conversation. I'm so sorry. That's something in my throat. <coughs> You started at mm -hmm. 7 30. It's been too much talking. 6.30 health, it's Toronto. Way too much talking. We started having a conversation about, okay, well, what are the parts of this plan that work? <clears throat> what are the parts of this plan that don't work? How can we refine the parts that don't work? So, for example, the, um, there's a street that runs through the site called Markham Street. And part of what we worked through, and the residents came to the table to work through, uh, was how can this street actually become a community destination? And the plan evolved and it became designed as a Woonerf and there wasn't any park on the site and part of that street became a, com became a community meeting place that really mattered for the community, that there would be this new place. And at the end of the process, the community was really excited. The heritage buildings were being retained. They cared about affordability. There's affordability as part of this project. The concern about height actually started to fade away. It was about, is this a good project that delivers on our livability objectives? My concern with height always is around the impact on the pedestrian realm and the impact on parks. If a tall building shadows a park, forget it. Uh, it's too tall. And, and adds any net new onto a, onto a park, that's a, that actually is a really good performance metric for how tall a building should be. And you get a different, it, it might mean that you actually get taller, thinner buildings than you're building in Halifax. <laughs> buildings that are taller but thinner because the shadow moves very quickly and has less of an impact on the park versus building buildings that have been kind of pancaked down and have a much greater impact on adjacent uses. So in that instance, I am concerned about livability. I'm concerned about quality of life. A taller building is often a better building because it has less of a shadow impact. And as a, you know, I'm a mother, I spent a lot of time when my kids were little in neighborhood parks because I live in a small urban house. And being in the sun versus the shade for a good five months of the year in Toronto, that really matters. It's the difference between saying, I will go to the park or I won't go to the park. So then a taller, more slender building is way better because the shadow moves more quickly. The park isn't in, in shade for an extended period of time. So I think in some ways it's a matter of reorienting the question around those livability objectives and what it is that you're seeking to create. What's the vision uh, that you have for your city? It's amazing that in one sentence you got applauses from two sides of the <laughs> end, so that was great. Uh, Alan, go ahead. Uh, Jennifer, <clears throat> we've met before during Halifax by Design. Um, what I think is very important for everyone to realize is that this is a study of yours, which is commissioned by UDI. And in that respect, um, it's a very Halifax study. Uh, the other people that are supporting it is Waterfront Development, Downtown Business Commission, Halifax Chamber of Commerce. When I, your back page of the report has your, your participants. Almost none of the 41 participants listed are what I would call citizens, active citizens. <coughs> um, I don't know where Dale Godso would put herself, but uh, there's one person perhaps from the Ecology Action Center, and you have no other participants in your study in the last three months of citizens who have been fighting and raising issues about buildings on the common, about how Quimple Road should go, about heritage districts, about our failure to get any more heritage districts. And so the issue that I feel your report perhaps hasn't addressed, you do suggest that some of the larger blank areas or the larger areas that are, have higher density should be built first. You want to get that process started. But you have some reservations about the large areas like this, the, uh, the lands uh, up at the north end of the city or Penhorn Mall would be another one that you're, you'd be worried about how to do that. And my, our concern, many citizens' concern is that they have built, they've re designated these corridors a lot of them have absolutely fine housing on them, and they want to take the part that fronts on Roby Street or Agricola or a Cottage in a Roby <coughs> and knock those houses down half a block. And you had one picture of that on one of your overheads. 
But in effect, we can get the density that these guys want, say they want, and are predicting we might get by building on many of those empty spaces as opposed to knocking down perfectly fine housing. So, so uh, why don't I answer, answer some of your questions well, there? Because I think you've raised... About, you talked about the polarization in Halifax, and that's partly where it lies, is a bunch of developers who want to knock down in one of your senior, your can senior we, uh, uh, people on your steering committee. Can we, can we get to as, your question? Uh, so two, so two things. I think there's a couple things in there I can respond to. And let me respond to the, the, the first comment that you made about the participation first. I was not running a consultation process. I was not asked to run a public consultation process. In fact, I was asked to undertake a professional peer review. And that's what I did. And we're very transparent about the process and what it was and who we spoke with. Um, a consultation process is actually something completely different and would take much more time. And you can take the comments that I've provided and see them as such. They're not a broad public consultation and they don't pretend to be. It's my opinion. I actually say that in the document that I've provided a review. I wanted to talk to some people to better understand the implications from a professional perspective. I did that and then I provided my opinion. That's all it is. Take that, take that for what it is. It may have value. Sadly, it may not have value. I hope it does have some value. But I think it's very important that there's a space for that to happen without that being a bad thing. Didn't pretend to be a consultation process, and it wasn't. That's the first. <clears throat> and on, that, on that point, I'd like to add this as well. The city has undertaken extensive amounts of consultation, and summaries are available publicly. We provided that to Jennifer as a, as a way of background. And also, as private citizens and developers that uh, funded this study, there is so much money and time available to them to try to do the right thing. Alan, it surprises me that after all, all these years, you managed to polarize the discussion. This is a study that is done independently, and it should be taken as such. And if there is merit in it, as Jennifer said, I hope you can take that on. If it's not, you can ignore it. So the second part with your concern with respect to um, the character of some of the streets, um, <clears throat> just in terms of how you characterize your comments, you suggested that that policy framework came forward from the industry, and I don't actually think it did, because I think if you spoke to some people in the industry, you'd find they have a lot of concerns with it. Um, the, uh, I, act, I completely agree with you. Uh, it's something I tried to make clear in the report. There's some areas, and I think Agricola is one of them, where um, it's, there's probably too much that's being proposed. There's actually a character there that's very special, Goddingen as well. There's some new buildings going up in Goddingen right across from the library that are very interesting, that are a scale that fits very well on the street. And I think that the, in some ways, that's exactly what I was talking about, about understanding the character of an area and deriving your policy framework from that character instead of sweeping really broad strokes. I would like to see the character of Goddingen described in the plan. And then I would like to understand how moving forward that character is going to be enhanced and protected. Uh, and with every, with every street, I think, with every corridor and with the center, what is the character? And if it doesn't currently have much of a character, then what is the future character that we're seeking to achieve? What will be the identity of this area moving forward? And I think that's an area where the plan really needs to be beefed up because it's missing that recognition of what makes each part of um, the various areas in the center special. Go ahead. Ms. Keesman, I'm aware that you have to put your best foot forward when you put up your um, vision for what you hope to be a, a walkable and livable city. Um, so, but I, I do have one caveat about that. I'm, I'm thinking of a folk singer from Quebec who wrote, Mon pays c'est le vert, my country is winter. And all of your photographs and all of your drawings showed lovely trees and leaf and it was <laughs> summer. <clears throat> As we know, that's not, you talk about the character of an area, we should talk about the character of Canada and also the character of Nova Scotia with the climate. And the climate here, uh, I love to bike, but I don't bike between January and May because it's, frankly, you risk your life in Halifax, for, at least for me at my age, on the kind of conditions that you'd be trying to bike. So the bikeways are not going to affect that. 
The other thing is, aside from the summer climate, there seem to be a lot of summer people, by which I mean people in the summer of their lives, 25 or under. I didn't see the people that are the most seriously affected in terms of how to get out of their buildings, which is a, a big issue, and you may not be able to, to answer that in just one question. But what I want to do is, how do you see this, your, your, your strategy working with, with uh, two things? One is the climate of this country. The other is Toronto is in a center of a very large, extensive uh, metropolitan area. There's the borough of Toronto, there's the greater Toronto area, and there's a lot of satellite cities. If you look at Halifax, uh, there's no bus service left anymore to the Annapolis Valley. There is almost no train service left. There's virtually no public transportation in a lot of the province. So much so it might be nice to say, well, let's get rid of the cars. The fact is it's not really practical if you have any business or, or uh, of any kind that are, that's out in the provincial areas because there's no public transportation. <coughs> so you can't really develop, I'm wondering how you can develop Halifax in isolation from the fact that, I don't want to say that we're in the middle of nowhere, but compared to Toronto, in a sense we are. So can you speak to something about that, please? Yeah, sure. That was actually my fifth point about integrated plans. Um, you can't talk about walkability without talking about your transit plan. So the, um, the vision of a walkable center, it's not actually my, my vision, it's the vision that's identified right at the front of the regional center plan. That's the objective. Um, and my point is, if you truly want to deliver on that, there's a series of other planning frameworks, such as a transit plan, that need to be fully integrated with delivering on those vision. That those two things are completely connected. They can't be, they can't be separated. With respect to climate, uh, two comments. The first is that Halifax is already a really walkable city. There's a lot of people out walking, and already is, is very walkable, um, compared to most cities in North America. And uh, we, in fact, um, are demonstrating in Toronto, and if you go to Quebec, uh, or if you go to Edmonton, that we can build um, winter cities that are both great walking and cycling cities, and in fact, it's easier to walk in winter than it is to drive. Uh, if you invest in the infrastructure, such as snow plows for sidewalks or plows for cycling lanes, to ensure that you have clear pathways. So if snow's an issue, cold weather is an issue, whether it's, you know, you need an umbrella or you need to buy Sorrells, which I do, and I never used to wear my Sorrells in the city, and I discovered this winter that I've hit some sort of tipping point. We've hit some sort of tipping point in the city because it's become totally acceptable because everybody's walking, and when it's snowy and slushy, you just wear your boots, and you wear your boots into a meeting. And I can say it wasn't like that 10 years ago, but we've built such a critical mass of people that are walking, and like me, sometimes walking 35 minutes from my house into the downtown core instead of taking transit. Uh, and part of that is about having clear pathways and having the right clothing. And the right clothing is by far much cheaper than any other kind of accessory, uh, like a bike or a transit pass, um, in, in order to facilitate your movement. So I think that we're demonstrating, and there's many other countries in the world that are way, way ahead of us on this. We're followers. Um, there's many winter cities in the world that have made cycling a year-round activity, and Toronto, um, Toronto saw a crazy thing happen with our bike share this year, which is our bike share, which has been a little bit fledging. It hasn't hasn't been that great. We expanded it last year, and this winter was the first winter where uh, there was almost no decline through the winter months of the bike share program, which is really interesting because it shows that as we're building separated cycling lanes, people are starting to bike throughout the winter, and I can say it's the first winter that I actually biked in the snow. I had never, I had been a fair weather cyclist as well, and this winter I started cycling in the snow as well. So we do change our mind, and when we change our infrastructure, we change the choices that people have. And I think part of being, you're welcome to disagree. <laughs> we have five more minutes, so if you can short, keep the questions short, that'd be great. Go ahead, Peggy. Oh, um, I'd just like to make a few comments. I was is, 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 is there a question or comments? We only have five minutes and people are at the mic. Is it a question or a comment? Because if it's comments, you can just email that to us. But if it's a question, we have five more minutes. I'm not sure I understand you, Mr. Kura. Is it a question or a comment? That's all I'm asking. Anyway, um, 
I, my comment um, throughout much of this process, including the participants that were listed here that, you, that we helped you review this, is that there's no real people in this city. I feel like we're a bunch of avatars being moved around. This is what will happen here. This is I'm, what will happen there. I'd love this to let you have the mic, but I'm sorry. We have five more minutes, and we have people at the mic. So if, well, if, you, if there's a question, I, I, please do ask. Yeah, and just as a point of clarification, I didn't go through a planning process and create a plan. I actually reviewed, oh, yeah, I uh, it was a technical review of a document, and uh, it wasn't a planning process. I didn't create a plan. I commented on a planning framework that was provided by the municipality uh, with the hope that there might be some help in okay. doing so. Can Thank I you, Peggy. I'm just going to go to, if, if you want to wait for the end, I'm going to go to the questions, then we can get to your comments, okay? okay. Thank you. Jenny, I go ahead. I would like to ask, I guess, for special <laughs> interest to be paid to the question this woman asked over here about small business. We had all the, the small businesses, the arts community got pushed out of downtown, and they've gone to Agricola and Goddington Street. What's going to happen? That's a question. What's going to happen to them next? So I think that's a, a really important question. And as I indicated when it was asked earlier, that it's actually a challenge when you're redeveloping sites to figure out ways that you can keep that fine grain character of certain streets. One of the tools that we used in the Toronto context uh, for Queen Street was the Heritage Conservation District. That was one of the tools to keep that granularity. Now, the irony is, is that um, as the areas developed around it, of course, that retail got bumped out and there's a much more upscale retail that, that exists there. But part of that is an evolution that exists in, in most cities and most places. I would suggest that there is an opportunity on the economic development side, and this is a really important plan integration that should be a part of the center area plan, what is the economic development strategy to incentivize and retain small scale business in the city? And I think that's a really good area of exploration and a really good area for some policy initiative to ensure that the smaller scale retailers have a place in the city as the city evolves and changes. It's precisely the kind of thing that now is the moment to evaluate and put some kind of policy uh, parameters in place. Thank you. Jenny, go ahead. Um, you've outlined some uh, pretty large visions in this review document and looked at a lot of new ideas and looked at a lot of different methodologies that can be used to achieve uh, different outcomes. And I'm wondering, were you one of the planners that uh, worked at HRM or were you one of the counselors who worked at HRM? Where would you start with this? If you were to look at this review and say, okay, we want to implement some of these things, how do you begin to even grasp how large this is and how much work it seems to undertake when you're already, you know, four years, almost five years now into a planning process? Uh, yeah, where do you begin? So I'll try to narrow it down a little bit, but I would say the first is that the existing policies need to be modeled uh, as case studies uh, in partnership with the industry to test their applicability on specific sites, because that's how you're going to then be able to refine the policies and identify if they're going to work or not. Um, I was talking with the counselors today and someone was uh, talking about a certain policy and I said, well, has there been any uptake on it? And he said, no. And I said, well, did you go to the industry and ask why? <laughs> like, I would go to the industry and ask why. Like, you're working, you're building the city together. There's a collaboration that's taking place. Uh, so you need to have those conversations to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Our whole IMIT incentive program came about by working in collaboration with the industry to identify what, what we needed to put in place in order to incentivize them coming to the table and investing in office in the core. So that would be the first thing is, Test what you've got and see whether it works. And if it doesn't work, you've got to fix it. Don't make it policy. Fix it first. But you have to test it to understand what works and what doesn't work. And that was beyond the scope of my review to do that testing. But that testing is absolutely essential. And make those case studies public. Show how they, show how they work to the public uh, so that when 
changes, which I suspect will happen in some areas, um, when they come forward, people understand why those changes are coming forward, why what was being proposed isn't in fact viable. That would be the, the first big move that I would say. The second big move I would say is to literally get out a map of, of the center and begin to identify what the character areas are and then overlay that with the facilities and services needs. And then describe those character areas. Descri Gottingen needs to be described in the plan, and Quinpool needs to be described in the plan, and it really needs two things. It needs a description of what's there today and what the vision is for the future. And then make sure that your policy actually delivers that. So that would be my second thing. Identify the character areas. You're talking about complete communities. What's the scale of those complete communities? What do they look like? You can base it on a 500 meter walking radii, or you could use natural boundaries in some instances. There's lots of planners who know, who know how to do these things. So that would be the second. Define the character, and then see if you're actually going to begin to deliver on this vision of a walkable center. Uh, the third is hire more heritage planners and put, a place, put in place a strategy to create heritage conservation districts and to expedite those heritage conservation districts. And I think part of that needs to be driven by a best practice approach. Um, and there's, you know, Montreal is probably the leader in the country in doing this. And, and their leadership around heritage preservation is something that we've often looked to in, in Toronto. So go to Montreal, um, see the size of their team, understand how their team works, understand how they're accommodating growth in relation to heritage buildings. There needs to be a much more sophisticated approach in this city to both protecting and enhancing and accommodating growth in relation to heritage resources. So some, you need staff to do that. There's three heritage planners at the city. It's not enough. You need significantly more people. And council can uh, put people in place and put a mandate in place to really take seriously the heritage of the city. And if that doesn't happen today, you will regret it 15 years from now. Just like there's people in this room who probably have regrets about things that didn't happen uh, 15 years ago. <laughs> so it, it, there really, I think, is, is, is an urgency around, around doing that. Um, and then the last piece would be, there's an exercise that needs to take place, and it probably involves economic development, and it involves a collaboration with the industry in the same room, talking about what growth really will materialize and what kind of incentives might be required in some areas and what that incentive framework might look like. Uh, because I think the risk is otherwise that you won't actually get the kind of growth and change that you're seeking. There's a role for the municipality to play. It's all very easy stuff then. What's that? All very easy stuff. Yeah, yeah, all easy stuff. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, um, I'm just... Um on your report, the last page included a picture, a uh, summary picture again, of some houses which I've identified as Queen Street, just north of Spring Garden. And um, I think that by including that, you're liking it. But I guess my point is that um, those houses, those buildings have no protection. They are not registered heritage. They're not part of a heritage district. I am concerned about all the buildings, which I'm sure are at least 90% of the buildings in the city are not registered heritage. And um, even though, and, and Can you there's do a question also, there? um, even when the heritage districts are fully finished, which as I see it might be years and years hence, there's still a lot of buildings in the city that are not in any way protected, including these. And I guess my point, my question is, are you able to recommend, my, my bugbear is that when a site is considered for development that doesn't include, a, it's not in a heritage district or doesn't include registered heritage buildings, um, they, the, 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 it's not even considered whether what's on the site or probably by the time it's come up for development, it's already, there, it's already being torn down. I would like to see the city, um, or that you recommend that the city consider a nominal form of overview before buildings are torn down, 
um, that are of a certain vintage. Thank you. You know, they may not be. Is, is there a question there? Sorry. Just yes. the time so, I, out, I think, so I think I can res respond to the concern that you're raising. So, and in some ways, it was my answer to the last question. Mm -hmm. um, there's no one whose job it is to do that. Um, we created a heritage management plan at the City of Toronto that was a strategy. We basically sat back and said, we have not, uh, for the past 50 years, um, properly protected heritage. Now we have a tremendous amount of growth happening. We're way behind. We're back on our heels. Um, what are we going to do? And so we created a, a heritage management plan strategy that had a bunch of different strategies. And uh, you can download that report and you can copy it, copy the parts that you like. One of them was putting a heritage impact statement as part of every um, every application. So every application now requires, it's a one page statement. Uh, often the developer, if there's no really obvious heritage resource, just checks it off themselves. Uh, sometimes uh, if it's uh, if it's a listed or designated building, that's a very obvious, but then there's the gray zone. And obviously we have discussions and this is contentious as to what is heritage and what isn't heritage. But that has been a tool to flag buildings. Um, and it's been a, po a tool to flag buildings for the municipality. To make my, my answer much shorter, what I'll say is, you actually need a heritage management strategy and there's a whole variety of strategies that you can use. Uh, one of the things that I think is really um, critical in this debate um, in this city is recognizing that you actually can't have it both ways. You can't freeze development in the city and protect heritage. I think that's a really important thing just to be honest about. Maybe because I'm from away, I can just say that. Because uh, I'm sort of getting that feeling in the room right now. Because this is where we were 10 years ago, I think, in this city. Um, I actually don't think you get it both ways. Um, and for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, and one of those reasons is that um, there's value to growth and change in this city. The peninsula has de-densified and still is nowhere near the density that it had 50, 40 years ago, something like that. Um, and it's a very luxurious thing for us to think we can keep everything to ourselves and keep everyone else out. Um, but I would also argue that it's, um, it's not responsible. Uh, a big part of this conversation about the center plan is also about changing the trajectory of this city to become more sustainable. It's about getting away from suburban sprawl and creating livable, walkable, dense urban places that offer a fundamental, fundamentally different opportunity for living than what um, has existed in this, in this city over the past, uh, past 30 years. And I get it that I'm probably pre preaching to the choir here, but the, the, the um, part of what I'm trying to do is link together the importance of significant growth and change and incentives for growth and change and protecting heritage assets, that those two things can actually go together. And the risk is that if there's a big battle in this city, which is either we, we freeze the city and we protect heritage, or we ignore heritage and we, and we just build whatever we want, wherever we want, and we kind of keep that separate, you will actually get a dog's breakfast and you'll destroy what's so special about this place. And I sort of think that's what's been going on here for a while. And so I think you need to come together. It's in everybody's interest to come together. It's really in everyone's interest to sort of kind of think about entering a new day and seeing those two things as being able to be conjoined, because they can be conjoined. And one of the, the most dense areas of the city and the fastest growing areas of the city in Toronto is the King Spadina district, which we just made a heritage conservation district. And you can put a 60 story tower on a warehouse as long as it's within our, within our guidelines. And we also see that as a tool for enhancing and revitalizing the heritage that exists in the core that would otherwise, otherwise disappear. But we also have other heritage conservation districts that are very frozen in time, where you can't change a window pane. Uh, so there's, there's a whole spectrum, and uh, getting it right, you can't paint it in broad strokes, it has to be very specific to specific areas, can actually mean you can create a very special place in Halifax, but only if you bring the two together. Just before we move to the next question, quick shout out to TJ McGuire for all the amazing pictures on the front and the back of the report. Thank you, TJ. Yes, thank you, TJ. Ross, go ahead. 
Hi, Jennifer. Uh, thanks for the shout out on Gottagen Street. We're very happy with the uh, new <laughs> building. One of the reasons we bought that property was uh, the zoning, and it was as of right. Everything we built is as of right. So one of the concerns I have with where the center plan seems to be going is all the, uh, the design review process. And uh, I think most developers in the city are trying to do a really, really good job uh, with their projects. So I'm interested in your, your feedback on the expansion of all the design review and just how the municipality is going to handle that kind of volume. And the second is a follow-up to Jenny's question, which I think is the right one. Where do we go from here? How does the municipality get back on track? Because I think they are off mm -hmm. track. Um, and in particular, um, I, I think that the problem we've got is we've got you know developers, uh, most of them trying to do the right thing. In a lot of cases, they're asking for more density. You go to these meetings, all the center plan meetings, last time, and then it stalled, and then this time, all the public consultation's been about height precincts, really. Where's the height? It's just lumps of height. And they haven't been focusing on what you're saying, which is building communities and where do we need a park? And you know, so most of these consultation meetings, it's really the developer asks for more height and the community gets a lump of coal. So it's a two-part question how, then. So how does the municipal so the second question is how the, how does the municipality walk their way back with the public to get them on board? They they need to give for the developers and I think make the process more streamlined. Yet the public, I think doesn't seem to understand uh, the development process and the balance? Uh, well, I think there's two parts, um, although I'm not going to pretend even remotely to have the answer to that. But the first part, I think, is why I said start with the modeling, because I think the modeling is going to demonstrate some of the inherent flaws in what's being proposed, which then gives license to move to a new, a new approach. Um, so I think start, that's why starting with the modeling is valuable. I also think that um, uh, there, do, there does need to be a big shift in the plan around the vision and what it is that you're seeking to cre create because the focus on height has actually, um, I think it's an interesting question. If you look at a project where you had a battle over height, whether you got a better building, um, and in most instances you probably didn't get a better building, uh, did you get a better city building project? Um, so I think that shifting the conversation is something that uh, there's an opportunity for leadership on doing that, and it's not going to happen without leadership. And I think it has to come from a whole variety of sectors within the community who are willing to work together. And I don't know, maybe that's some kind of collaborative, interdisciplinary group that works together on how to advance this in a way that begins to break down some of those traditional camps that have been set up that are resulting in a battle instead of resulting in great outcomes. So last question, better be good. <laughs> no pressure. My name is uh, Alec McKinnon. Uh, I grew up on Goddard Street, uh, and I've lived around there for most of my life. And recently... You should write the description. You should write the character statement. Well, yeah, Five paragraphs. That's all it and, needs. And there's recently been a, uh, a Heritage District proposed sort of around there. Um, and I guess when I first saw that, I was I immediately thought that's a threat to affordable housing. Goddard Street in that area, that whole north end, has become much more desirable. Housing prices have gone up. Uh, and it's got to the point where, like, if I had a family, you know, next week, I would have to start considering, you know, moving out of that area for the first time in my life. And that's not something I want to do. And so I guess I want to go at the, the Heritage District from the other way. Can you, you've almost convinced me that we can do it. Uh, what kind of Heritage District uh, in God, around Gaza Street would allow uh, affordable housing as well? So I'm glad you, uh, you've raised this. It's actually a very good segue for me to end on because um, uh, I, what I'm doing next after leaving my role as a chief planner is I'm heading up a national non-for-profit that is a partnership between the private sector and the public sector. And our objective is to build 50,000 units of affordable housing across Canada for a very simple reason, which is that we see this as the biggest threat to the stability of Canadian economy and to Canadian cities. 
uh, that people can no longer come into our cities. What's been so beautiful about them is that you can come into our city and be welcomed and be fully integrated into a community because they have been so affordable. And that's no longer happening on tr in Toronto and it's no longer happening in Vancouver. Um, and if you do your plan right, it won't be, it, and you get your heritage conservation districts, that'll no longer be the case here either. Affordability just doesn't happen. Um, as your city increases livability, the most livable cities are also the least affordable, which is not something that planners, we were not talking about this 10 years ago. It really caught us off guard. And Richard Florida has just written a book called The New Urban Crisis, which is exactly about this, that the best places in the world are also becoming the most exclusive. And the only way to counter that is by having an explicit strategy that is about building affordable rental housing and a really high quality affordable rental housing. And unless it's explicit, it won't happen, it won't happen by default. It won't happen accidentally. Uh, the example I've been giving all day is New York City. People think of New York City as a beacon of capitalism. And in fact, in New York City, 82% uh, of the population in Manhattan is housed in affordable rental. And that affordable rental includes social, it includes rent control, and it includes another definition that they have of affordable rental. But what's so interesting about that is that if you're a teacher or a nurse or you drive a bus or a subway in New York City or you're an admin assistant, where are you going to live in New York City? Well, you're actually going to live in affordable rental housing. And so Creative Housing, the company that I'm heading up, is about... Uh, delivering affordable rental housing targeted to key workers in cities. And uh, I think that the only way you can do this is by identifying sites for affordable rental housing within specific neighborhoods. This goes back to my suggestion of doing a complete community assessment. Some areas might actually have a tremendous amount of affordable housing or social housing already. And what they need is, uh, they just need more market housing. You shouldn't add. So you, this is why you have to do an assessment on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. Um, we had this in downtown Toronto in Regent Park, was all social housing. And the way that neighborhood has been revitalized and strengthened has been by adding market housing. It needed more market housing. So when you take that complete community lens and you look at areas of the city, what you're going to propose for that area is going to be different in different areas. And so I think if you're advancing with a heritage conservation district, you're concerned about affordability, as I think you should be, there needs to be an intentional strategy. And I talked to the mayor about this today here, and he uh, is very keen on doing something proactive. Uh, because relatively speaking, Halifax is really affordable. Um, but I don't, think, I, don't think, I don't think that'll last. I honestly don't. Um, and we, we were blindsided in Toronto. It never, we always thought housing was too much money. Everyone thinks it's too much money. But we never thought what would happen over the past two years would happen in our city. And it just did. And it means we need a completely new approach to housing. Thank you. So, just a couple of... Just a couple of closing comments. Alan, first of all, we expect a uh, neighborhood analysis from you in a couple of weeks. You can send that <laughs> to the city or us. Uh, thank you very much, Jennifer, for making the effort and doing an amazing job to give us this perspective. I'd like to add to something that I was having a discussion until midnight on Twitter about sexism in planning, and I really want to add this, that if that's okay with you. Um, someone pointed out that we were talking about sexism in planning and in the industry. Someone pointed out that out of all the 41 people that were consulted through, through the uh, this process, only seven of them were women. Jennifer and I talked about it uh, at dinner, and I'd like to acknowledge that we need to do better, and I was part of the uh, group that put that list together. So in my capacity, I'll be doing better next time to make sure that we have more women's voices coming to, the, uh, to our planning world. And I'm, I'm glad that it was you that did this study, um, and that, that, that perspective is really important. The second thing is I'd like to really thank the people that were involved with putting this study together, the UDI Center Plan Committee. Uh, if I can ask you to stand up, Peter Pauly, Eric Berschel. Uh, we have Ben right there. Very shy. Yeah, very shy. <laughs> Cesar Sala, is he here? Cesar here? No. And, and last but not least, Christine, who've been really helping out from everything, from A to Z. She's all the way in the back. 
Thank you very much for all of your help throughout. This is not the end, this is the beginning. I know that's cliche, but I have to say it. <laughs> I'd like to think that we've done what we can in our capacity to deliver something that can be used as a guide on the next steps. And I'd like to encourage you all to take that as an invitation to, to move the conversation forward and try to get the center plan, this success story that we all want it to be. Jennifer, thank you again for coming down to all of us.